uh, Ronald Larson from High Trust, we are a cybersecurity company, and by the way, uh, our CTO is part of the NIST. So, in fact, I would like to make a general comment, and I think when you speak about Ackerman, I think we need to take even a different position. <coughs> we need to prevent, and to prevent means that we need to rethink the complete software development cycle. Because in fact, when you speak about VanaCrypt or vulnerabilities, you need exploit. So we need to go back to the roots of the development of the software. And there, I think we need from a, let's say, best practice, from a standardization point of view, enforce certain things. Because in fact, today we are facing a very uh, challenging situation with the notion of DevOps, with the notion of agility in development. In fact, the quality of the code is going down. And as you know, in the part of the key chain, you need exploit mechanism in order to deploy a malware. And I think that's where we need to start, to go back to how to enforce software with quality. It's not a question only about backdoors, it's the way people are developing software. And when I'm looking at you know, whatever happened with, let's say, the big vendors, I think they are facing challenges about how to educate people to develop good quality. And I think when you mention about the skills, that's the first thing. Let's go back to the you know, education at the university level. When you look about the notion of code review, quality of code, it's really it's a minimal at the university level. And I think we need to start by that uh, before going to the other aspect, because otherwise we'll never solve the problem of, let's say, deployment of malware. There is another element you mentioned about the automotive industry. Uh, machine to machine, and I think there, there is a major challenge. None of the vendor, I'm not speaking about the manufacturer, I'm speaking about Bosch, all the different vendors will put enough money in making sure that the kernel of the devices that are onboarded in the car have enough good quality from a software point of view. Because for them, it's, a, it's about cost. So there is an element we are facing a challenge there are you know, hundreds of devices in a car, manufactured by different people, <coughs> and there I think we need to drive you know, the notion of standardization between them about you know, what will be the best practice. And that's you know, when you speak with BMW and all the other guys, we need also to put in, in, uh, in, uh, let's say, in perspective that when we are speaking about machine to machine, it's a multi-party. You have the manufacturer like a BMW, but you have a service provider, a telco because in fact you are transferring data between multiple different parties. And there today, I think we are really just at the beginning of understanding what might be the challenges. And already the cyber guys, the cyber criminals, have a very good understanding about how to manipulate the complete infrastructure. So coming back, my question is, from your perspective, from the parliament perspective, how you will work around you know, defining best practice for software development cycle and to enforce that, to force the major vendor to respect and to avoid that we have you know, stupid exploit mechanisms like buffer overflow, memory corruption, you name it. Because that's the first thing to solve. I, I agree with uh, most of what you have said and I would like to answer perhaps uh, in, in the way that um, what we need to do in order to get these like uh, responsible uh, uh, engagement of uh, producers and, and, and uh, programmers is that we strengthen those uh, institutions and agencies who are advising uh, those people. And that is, for example, ENISA and the national search, and that is also data protection authorities, that is many uh, institutions and, and many frameworks around where those like trainings happen and where those advice is given. Uh, advice will not be given and cannot be given by parliamentarians at the end, that's clear. But what we should also do, and I wouldn't underestimate that too, is that there needs to be a mechanism, uh, a regulatory mechanism to assure that there's no like race to the bottom when it comes to uh, defining standards, but that there is more or less a top, a top runner, a front runner approach that uh, we have security by design somehow also being set as the rule and that is something which we need to discuss and if you talk about the vendors uh, responsibility for example I also see that the chain of liability will be 
the most important leverage to achieve a high standard in all uh, uh, in, in all situations of the manufacturing process and vendoring, uh, vending process. Maybe that's American European Central Bank. Just about this chain of liability, uh, which indeed is, I think, is a key of key importance. But do you foresee any initiatives coming from the European Commission, European Parliament, European Council? about enshrining this maybe in legislation and so on. Mm -hmm. Because we can speak about, yes, it's very important, and so on and so on, but in the end it's about who's paying, eh? where are the incentives? <coughs> are you uh, thinking about any in uh, initiatives from your hand in this context? Mm -hmm. When it comes to uh, liability, there are very less incentives to be given very often. Uh, it is clear that uh, nobody really wants to be liable because that's always about costs. That's also <laughs> the reason why we had quite a lot of years now where this question about the liability chain in IT products uh, was discussed. But uh, more or less, never it really came down to a proposal because the, the, the lobbies against it were quite strong. But now I think more and more that people understand not only the end users and we as citizens, but also companies and representatives of, of many businesses realize that they suffer from this uh, uncertainty and from this situation because at the end they, they might be uh, either inadequately being held liable for things which they have no influence on or they might be in the situation of being the victim themselves uh, and losing uh, uh, quite a lot of money due to attacks happening and vulnerabilities not being uh, mitigated before. So I see that there is a huge pressure to go forward with such a liability sh a scheme. I see it also a, 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 um, it developed that there is positions in, in various political uh, families at the moment and I have the feeling that yesterday when we had the hearing of the uh, commissioner designate Gabriel on uh, the new uh, digital uh, commission post uh, that she realizes this as one of the important issues of her uh, um, upcoming two years so I'm, I'm at least very hopeful that there will be uh, uh, work in the Commission done. If that leads to a proposal before the next uh, European elections, uh, which we can also work and in, in the European Parliament, where a majority agrees that this is a necessary <coughs> uh, building block, uh, that I can't uh, uh, like promise. But um, my impression is that there is high uh, uh, push also of the Parliament, at least with this uh, um, robotics report and also with the resolutions we had, the Commission knows that they have to deliver in this area. The question <coughs> is at the end only what they will deliver, if it will be more or less uh, uh, a scheme of, of self-regulation or if it is also a really a new kind of regulatory standard for liability. <coughs> I would absolutely favor the latter one because it builds also more legal certainty for everyone using it. And every business will be affected in the future. That's different than before. Don't you think that, for instance, the development of a robust uh, cyber insurance market will help in giving market solution to this issue of liability? I'm, I'm quite sure that there's also a market opportunity in it at the end uh, because it will not only lead to a way how uh, risk can be mitigated and, uh, and allocated um, uh, like to those who are really able to solve the problem because in most of the cases, um, as I said, many businesses are confronted with uh, vulnerabilities or risks which they not really can mitigate themselves. They need others for that. And uh, that is something, if we solve that problem, then it will create also a better market uh, atmosphere for those uh, trying to build new cybersecurity standards in their own uh, infrastructure and to choose the products which are, uh, like, in, 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 in the view of IT security, quality, better quality and which deliver for better quality. And, um, and therefore, I would even say this could be also an economic chance for the European Union as a market to build uh, a trustful uh, IT security infrastructure and, and, and market schemes so that everybody can trust that if you get products or services uh, made in Europe, that you have also a, a trustful liability scheme and a, a trustful standard in, included into it. So I absolutely see that there's also an economic chance uh, in it. Uh, Paul Timmers, uh, speaking here independently, formerly European Commission. Uh, 
many questions that we could ask to you about non-legislative measures that you would be uh, interested to support or how you would look at sectoral legislation from uh, a cyber security point of view. But perhaps just one uh, here. What would you want to support in terms of international measures where Europe can play a role? We all already do that. Uh, I think not so bad when we talk about ISO standards and the engagement into standardization on a global level. I think that's important because that's also something which producers take into account uh, when, when they already today produce uh, systems. But I also agree uh, to what has been said at the beginning, that there's international standards to be made also seen from a regulatory framework and that perhaps we need some kind of conventions, not only, for example, as we have with the Cybercrime Convention on, of the Council of Europe on uh, like responsibility in, in a criminal uh, um, uh, prevention, but also that we need conventions uh, for responsibility in civil liability cases and in, in, uh, not undermining dramatically the standards which we have because uh, the big threat is that of course this will be used also more and more by certain actors to uh, impact stability of the market, stability of processes of infrastructure and so we need safeguards to be assured and I guess that uh, what we've done in the European Union with the NIST directive and with the cooperation of certs that this should be also boosted on international level. Of course, that always holds the huge risk that sharing information on a global level and working together on a global le level, not only in law enforcement, but also in IT security, carries quite a lot of risks too. So we need to make sure that uh, there's no, um, uh, um, yeah, that, that we are not like, uh, undermining our own efforts in achieving a secure infrastructure by getting on board actors, international actors, which doesn't really <coughs> follow our values. Uh, so it, it will be also uh, still needed that we set a standard as Europeans and that we expect others in the international and the global landscape to follow our ideas. A little bit like we do in data protection when we talk about adequacy uh, decisions, for example. And I think that th such mechanism could also work uh, in, in IT security uh, standards on a market uh, base.